the track is a monthly web TV show about cryptozoology, natural history, green issues, and whatever else the team feel like making up as they go along. Enjoy. In the 1930s, a remote farmhouse in Cashin's Gap on the Isle of Man became the focus of weird events. Following a poltergeist outbreak, a small strange creature appeared. The Irving family, who owned the house, heard the animal speak. It claimed to be a mongoose called Jeff, who had been born in India in 1852. Jeff haunted the family for almost a decade and became world famous. He was even mentioned in the British Parliament. Although the house at Cashin's Gap was demolished in 1971, Jeff remains a Fortean icon to this day. Hello again, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. It's me, uh, Barry Tadcaster, back again. And uh, this is my old mate, Jeff the Talking Mongoose. I'm the Earth Wonder at World, me. Thou shalt never know what I am. I already know what you are, you're a talking mongoose. Oh, that's by the by, that's by the by. I was born in New Delhi in 1852. Hey! Well, you've aged quite well, ain't you, mate? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. On today's episode, we'll be encouraging the rats. We're encouraging the rats and making them feel confident and good about themselves. I really like the old credits. This is Lake Windermere, and although I've only ever been there a couple of times in my life, three to be exact, it is a place where I spent large amounts of my childhood, because the children's author, Arthur Ransom, wrote a series of books between 1929 and 1947, most of which were set in a lake in the north, which was a composite of Lake Windermere and the nearby Coniston Water. And so when, about 17 years ago, there were a series of sightings of a mysterious creature on Lake Windermere, I decided that I had the chance of a lifetime to go off and play Swallows and Amazons as an adult. On the 23rd of July 2006, between 12 and 1 o'clock, Steve Burnip, a holiday maker from Hebden Bridge in Yorkshire, was standing with his wife and some friends on Watborough Point, a small rocky promontory just below Ray Castle on the western shores of the lake. It was a fine July afternoon and one of the warmest on record. They saw a disturbance in the water that looked like a boat wake. It was caused by an animal which appeared to be at least 20 feet long and which was moving faster than a rowing boat. They saw what appeared to be a head and two portions of a long grey body and although they watched the animal for approximately a minute, no visible eyes or facial features could be seen. Steve had a camera in his pocket, a powerful digital instrument, with an 8 megapixel capacity, but by the time he thought of using it, the creature was too far away. He did take a photograph, which we have seen. It appears to show several slate grey humps in the water, approximately 50 yards away, but for personal reasons, Steve was loath to release the pictures to the press. A week or so later, he told the story to the editor of a local newspaper, who was a personal friend, and on Friday the 18th of August we were contacted by a reporter from the Westmoreland Gazette, 
who'd Googled the subject of giant fish in the UK and found that after our encounter with the giant catfish in Lancashire during 2002, we were generally considered to be the UK's leading experts on the subject. We were immediately interested, and as a result of our co conversations, the paper ran a follow-up story appealing for further witnesses. Over the next month, we received six further eyewitness accounts. Interestingly, one was from the late 1950s and another from the early 1980s. The other contemporaneous sightings were followed in much the same pattern as Burnip's, but, for me at least, the most exciting account came from Kevin Boyd, an amateur diver who is extremely conversant with the wildlife of the area and who has seen eels of over six feet in length on a number of occasions, both in Windermere and in the neighbouring lake of Coniston Water. The CFZ carried out two expeditions to the lake, one in 2006 and one a year later, and we made the first of our YouTube movies, punningly called Eel or No Eel, on the subject. And as a result of that, many, many years later, my old friend Richard Freeman was contacted by somebody from a website called Lad's Bible, asking him to go back to the lake and have another bash at seeing if we could find the giant eels. Well, once again, I'm taking advantage of the fact that we have with us my old friend and compadre, Richard Freeman. Richard, why do you, we think, why do you think, why does the CSZ think that the best cause the best culprit for lake monsters, at least in Northern Europe, are eels? Well, there is a theory, <coughs> and <coughs> we must recall that this is only a theory, it's not scientific fact, but it makes more sense than anything else. Uh, the European eel lives in fresh water. When it gets ready to breed, uh, they don't have sexual organs at all, any of them until they reach sexual maturity, and we still don't know what triggers this. Uh, Sigmund Freud, before he was a psychologist, was a biologist, and he dissected thousands of eels trying to find uh, genitals and couldn't because they weren't sexually mature. But when the biological trigger happens, whatever it is, they swim out into the Atlantic Ocean to the Sargasso Sea where they breed and then die. And then the babies um, swim back to the ancestral waters. So there's a couple of theories about this. Some think it, they're following scent trails, others think that they're navigating by magnetic fields or by the moon even. We don't really know. Eels are very mysterious fish. There's a lot we don't know about. But the theory is that every so often you get an eel that does not sexually mature. And we call these eunuch eels because they're they never develop genitals and they stay in fresh water getting older and older and bigger and bigger. Nobody knows exactly how old they get or how big they get but there are, there are some very interesting stories about huge eels. Uh, in 2004 some Canadian tourists said that they saw a eel in the shallows at Loch Ness that was 25 feet long. Uh, another story comes from Ireland from a place called Drewston House and uh, it was owned by a family called the McVeighs and uh, Major McVeigh who was in the, the army and serving in India had come home on leave and uh, <coughs> the shepherd who was looking after the flocks said that they were uh, dogs, feral dogs killing the sheep so they poisoned these dogs and the bodies were left by one of the, the two lakes that are on the Drewston estate now these lakes had a, a dodgy reputation with the local people who said that there were monsters in them. Well, when they came to clean up the dogs and take the carcasses away the next day, the, the dog carcasses were gone, but there were two colossal eels dead by the side of the lake. They'd eaten the, the carcasses of the dogs and ingested the poison. One was 12 feet long and the other was 10 feet long. Now Major McVeigh had these huge eels photographed on the... Uh, the steps leading up to uh, the, the 
entrance to Drewston House and they had two big pillars and they had them with all their, their servants and family and these two immense eels hung upon these pillars. Now this photograph uh, was still around in the 1950s because M Major McVeigh would show it to people around the local pubs who doubted his story. But the M McVeigh family had moved over to um, to Australia, they emigrated to Australia. So what became of the photo, I don't know. Um, I, I found a, a group for Irish expats in Australia online and you know I wrote in about it with the story, but apart from a couple of people saying it's very interesting, uh, nobody knew about the photograph and it's got no further. I've written to local newspapers in that part of Ireland and local museums, but I never got anything back. So. Um, that seems to have hit, hit a, a brick wall, but it'd be fascinating uh, to see this photograph if it still exists, because the people that got it, if it still exists, probably don't know the zoological importance of it. And Ireland is full of these stories about ho what they call horse eels, huge eels that were about 30 feet long and as thick as horses, hence the name horse eel, and they had their, the fin running along the back that looked a little like a horse's mane. But it makes more sense than some sort of a prehistoric monster in, in, the, in these lakes. So what happened with um, Lad Bible? They contacted you and said, hey, it's been 15 years since you've been to Loch, uh, been to the Lake District looking for giant eels. Do you want to go back? Well, basically what they wanted to do was, it wasn't a serious investigation, it was just a piece of fun. but. They paid me handsomely for it. They put me up in a lovely hotel and paid my expenses there and back and brought all my food and drink. So I wasn't going to say no. They just they, they got a, a chap from inner city London and they sent him up to the Lake District where he's never been before to hunt monsters with a monster hunter. And that was basically it. It, wa it was um, all, all tied in with some video game or other, the name of which I can't remember. Uh, but he was a video game reviewer and a grind DJ, whatever the hell that is. Um, uh, uh, he was called Manga, as in the comics. And um, we just went out on a boat. I told him about the background of of the the monster and its sightings going back to 1959. Particularly, the sighting that interested me the most was the uh, the the, the the Mark Plant uh, sighting from 1959. Mark Plant said he had been 20 in 1959 and he was on a sailing holiday with his friends um, on the Lake Windermere and they went every year. And this one particular year he said something drew up alongside the boat that was cylindrical in shape. It was uh, a grey brown in colour uh, with a mottled effect on it which he likened to a, uh, a tabby cat. Uh, the skin was like he said old leather like you see on an old sofa. He couldn't see the head, he couldn't see the tail, he could only see the middle section of it, which was moving side to side. Uh, he said the section he could see was 15 feet long, so the whole thing would have been considerably bigger with the head and then with the tail on it. Uh, he and all his friends watched it, and then they, it drew away from the the boat they were in and overtook one and, and swam away. And when he got to the youth hostel that they were staying at, he mentioned to the guy that ran the hospi um, hostel, have you got anything in Lake Windermere like they've supposed to have in Loch Ness? And he got such a withering look that he never mentioned it again until the new spate of sightings. And, and we went and interviewed him. So basically what we did when we were up there, I told him the background of the story. They wanted me to say that I'd seen something lunging up and grabbing a living swan and pulling it under the water for dramatic um, reasons. Of course, I never saw that. That never happened. That's actually from a book called The Pike by Cliff uh, Twemlow, who was a uh, horror author and a bouncer, amongst other things. And he wrote this fantastic book called The Pike, sort of a freshwater jaws about a great white shark-sized pike in Lake Windermere that gobbles up locals and tourists. And they were going to make it into a film with um, Joan Collins, and they actually built a uh, full-size animatronic giant pike, which apparently is now in a museum in Japan. But they ran out of money, uh, sadly. It would have made a great film. And one of his friends, um, Brian Serling Veet, who's a friend of mine, is at, at the minute looking into 
getting someone to, to take on a script and do it as a period piece set in, set in the 70s. But th that was taken from a horror novel. I never saw that. But they, they wanted me to say that for dramatic reasons. And then we went out baiting with um, fish oil and fish meal, um, tying it in hessian sacks to a, a boy, which is something I've always wanted to do seriously uh, uh, over a long period of time. And they had a little underwater camera. And we went out on a boat. And then they... They made a big wake with this other boat and pretended it was the wake of the monster eel and the, and the guy from London got all panicky and uh, and then we got back to shore and he said, oh no, I don't, uh, monster hunting uh, in real life is too much for me, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it to video games. So basically it was just a bit of fun to promote a video game, but it was nice to see Lake Windermere again and I had a jolly good time. And they were a lovely group of people. They were crew and everybody were great. But it wasn't a serious, um, a serious expedition or anything. What's this footage of um, what appears to be a giant pike outside a building up there? Oh, well, that wasn't there the last time I was at Windermere. It, it's just a, a 10, 12 foot long pike uh, made out of what seems to be fiberglass that's hung up outside it outside a building. I don't have no idea why, whether it's to promote angling or something. I've, I've no idea, but it reminded me of the, of the book, The Pike, so I, I took some footage of it. The whole story of the giant fish in Lake Windermere is, I suspect, not over yet. Not even for the CFZ. Now, there have been stories of big pike in the lakes for many years, indeed in the first of the Swallows and Amazons novels, there is an encounter with a huge pike. And I was rather pleased that at the end of Richard's footage of his trip to Lake Windermere was this, proof that these remarkable and beautiful creatures still exist in the lake. We'll be back one day, I promise you. Well, I have sort of good news for you. Wally the Walrus is back. Apparently, our pinniped visitor has decided he didn't like France and he didn't like Spain and he wanted to come back in a sort of pinniped Brexit to, to Blighty because Blighty was the one place that he felt at home. But sadly, it hasn't worked out like that because unfortunately Wally has done an awful lot of damage to boats and property in the Scilly Isles which is where he's been for the last few weeks and the forces of law and order in the Scilly Isles are trying to push him off to sea to send him away so he will never darken their shores again and go off to some other place which is I think rather a pity, because in the words of the immortal Flanders and Swan, Wally obviously thinks that the English are best. The English are best, the English are best, large marine pinnipeds put that to the test. The English are best. The English are best. I wouldn't give tuppence for none of the worst. Ha ha! Huzzah! Huzzah! Rule Britannia! Hooray! Huzzah! Some of these objects may be unnatural. Some of these objects may be blasphemous. Some of these objects may be perverse. Some of these objects may burn your stomach. It's show and tell. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're back here again with another episode of Show and Tell. And I suppose, really, to be professional, I should continue with the artifice that I have my special guest who is, once again, it is my old friend, 
Richard Freeman, who's there with Archie on the sofa. And I should pretend that I have my special guest specially flown in from somewhere exotic to be here for this show. But actually, it's filmed about 20 minutes after we filmed the last episode about the thylacine skeleton, 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 jaws, whatever you call the bloody things. But, Richard, what have we got tonight? So, Richard, what is that? It's a model of the ivory-billed woodpecker, the second largest woodpecker ever to have lived. So, tell me, tell us about the ivory-billed woodpecker. Does it still exist? Quite possibly. The ivory-billed woodpecker lived over uh, a large area of the southeastern United States and also on the island of Cuba. So these um, semi-tropical uh, hardwood forests. Uh, it's a very big woodpecker. I mean, if it, it would be stunned like that if it was alive today. Um, and it relied on very old trees for its food and its nesting areas because, like all wood woodpeckers, it ate um, uh, wood boring grubs and when these the swamps in which it lived were started to be drained and cleared for agriculture and other re um, reasons it spelt uh, the death knell for the ivory billed woodpecker it was supposed to have disappeared around about um, the time of the, the second world war I think the 1940s maybe just after the second world war if memory serves uh, but there have been reports of surviving ivory bill woodpeckers both on um, the island of Cuba which is much, much less disturbed and on um, mainland uh, America but these these have yet to be verified it had a very close relative called the imperial woodpecker which was even bigger that came from the highlands of Mexico but the, the forests where that used to be used to live um, I think are all well and truly cut down for agriculture now so the, I think the imperial woodpecker is, is truly extinct but there's there's still some hope around that the the, the great ivory bill is still with us. Wasn't there a piece of footage taken of what was alleged to be an ivory billed woodpecker back in 2005 or 2006? Yeah that, I remember that story broke just as I was going off to hunt the Mongolian death worm yeah, um, there was also some uh, audio taken uh, of of the animal pecking, the distinctive noise it makes when it pecks, but someone said that might have been gunfire. Uh, the actual film, um, it's not conclusive. If you were a betting man, and I suppose in a way all cryptos were just a betting man, but if you were a betting man, do you think the ivory bull woodpecker has survived? 50-50. And where would you think it's most likely to be found? Cuba. And the Cuban subspecies, it was a different subspecies, wasn't it, the Cuban one? I believe so, yeah. yeah. Because they found a tail feather of the Cuban one in sort of 1970 or something, didn't they? Mm. Under peculiar circumstances. Yes, but the, the island of, of Cuba, um, well, the area where they, the, the woodpeckers are supposed to live, is, is not that disturbed. So it wouldn't surprise me if there's, there's a relic population there. <laughs> If you want to support us and help us make more content like these, please press like, subscribe, follow our Facebook page and check out our Patreon. And as the ghost of Joe Strummer and I are telling you, please remember to ring that notification bell, otherwise you won't be told when we've got another show. And that would be an awful pity, wouldn't it?
And so, ladies and gentlemen, here we are at the end of another episode. And before Richard Freeman and I walk off slowly into the long night in order to go and drink wine and talk nonsense about whatever the world is throwing at us this week, we'd like to say a big thank you to everybody who's helped with this episode. And I'd like to say particularly Richard, who's over there and there. Hello, Richard. Uh, there's Richard, there's Carl, there's Graham, and there's Louis. Louis, in particular, we couldn't do this without you, mate. I'd also like to say thank you to the ladies who keep the home fire burning, Charlotte, Maxine, and Sarah. And I want to say a big thank you to everybody who's working on the new website, particularly Lizzie, and Rosie, and Ravi, and Sartak. But it's been a long episode, it's been a fun episode, and Richard and I have had great fun doing it. And I tell you what, I think I want to have Richard to come up here very soon to do some more episodes with me, because it's more fun doing it with him than it is doing it without him. So, ladies and gentlemen, that's the end for this week. I'll be seeing you again in seven days' time, because Saturday afternoon... It's CFZ on the track time. And so, I'll be there. Will you be there? Because if you'll be there, I'll be seeing you.